City West, how you guys doing? Yeah. And a shout out to our people sitting on the stools back there. Y'all are awesome for sticking around with us. I know we filled up Kid City. Uh, this feels like a good time to mention we have lots of room at 9 o'clock. If uh, <laughs> anyone's feeling a little claustrophobic in here right now. Uh, it's so incredible to see this many people uh, just filling up the seats. All of us coming together, gathering to be a part of the movement of Jesus. Uh, I, I'm joking, but I'm also not. We do have lots of, of room. We have full kids service. We have the exact same service at 9 o'clock. I know it's summer, and we're staying up late, and, and we're, we're sleeping in. Um, but uh, if some of you guys who are all in would commit to 9 o'clock, it would really free us up to have an adequate amount of room here as well as to continue growing in all of our services. So something for you to consider coming to 9 o'clock on, on Sundays. We're in week three of this series that we're calling Be Humble. We've, we're taking four weeks to look at a biblical view of humility, why it's important to our lives as individuals, as well as why it's important to the movement of Jesus. And I hope that so far this series has been very helpful to you, even in just the preparation and, and, and the research and the writing of this series. Uh, these like fresh new perspectives on humility have been so important to my own life. Today we're gonna be in the New Testament in the book of 1 Peter, Chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 13 to 17. Uh, in, in this, Peter's writing to a group of believers, and he says, Submit, not our favorite word, submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. And so submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. Would you guys pray with me? God, we come before you and we open your word and I ask that once again you would just bring it to life for us. Uh, God, that you would help us to understand what it's saying to us in the context that it was written in so that we can apply it to our lives today and how you're wanting to use this passage uh, to just get us closer to the power of the purpose you created us with and uh, that your spirit would just be guiding uh, this room together in this gathering. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in 1995, the, the UN declared 95 was going to be the year of tolerance. The year of tolerance. And here we are 23 years later with all of our problems solved. So thank you, United Nations, <laughs> circa 1995. Uh, you can't blame them, as is the case today. Tensions were continuing to rise. It seemed like people were becoming very entrenched in their own ideologies. There was basically uh, no bipartisanship. No one was coming together from different backgrounds and beliefs to work on things together. There was a lot of conflict in society. And so because of this, they decided 95 would be the year of tolerance. And it's interesting because the United Nations is a very powerful uh, entity, and so people started putting initiatives together to try and create tolerance in society. But, but when you took the idea of tolerance and put it in all of these different cultural contexts, it began to mean different things based on the different areas where it was trying uh, to be uh, initiated. And so here in the West, over time, even the definition of tolerance has changed. Originally, in 95, when they launched the Year of Tolerance, uh, it, it basically just meant, I have a belief, you have a contrary or opposite belief, and we're just going to find some way to exist in some relative measure of peace. Tolerance is like the lowest common relational denominator. It requires no empathy, sympathy, no understanding, no crucial conversations. You believe one thing, I believe something different, and we're just not going to kill each other. That's basically tolerance. And for someone as optimistic as I am, that is way too low of a goal. Like, I don't want to just tolerate. When I think about things I tolerate, I think about the laundry. Like, everyone hates doing laundry, but you have to or else you're nasty. You have to do it. <laughs> There's not an option. If you passionately love doing laundry, first of all, what is wrong with you? That is the word. And second, if you need to exercise those passions somewhere, Katie and I can hook you up. We have plenty of laundry that you could come do for us. 
Tolerance is just like the lowest relational rung on the ladder, but that's what it meant. It meant uh, you have your beliefs, I have mine, let's just coexist and more or less ignore each other. Now over time, as the rise of postmodern thought came into existence, especially here in the West and here in America, postmodern thought, which is rooted in the belief that there's no such thing as absolute truth, the definition based on the absence of absolute truth in our society changed from you believe something and I believe something different and we're just going to figure out how to coexist. It changed radically. The new definition of tolerance is I believe something, you believe something contrary or opposite to my belief, and we're both right, and so let's just celebrate each other. And it's a beautiful sentiment. I believe something, you believe the opposite, you know what, there's no absolute truth anyway. Let's just both be right and go about our own way. And this can work on very superficial levels. It's a nice sentiment. On the level of opinion, this can work. Katie loves purple, I like brown. I can celebrate that she likes purple. She happens to look real fine in purple, so it kind of works out for everybody. On the opinion level, there's this new definition of tolerance. It's not I'm right and you're wrong. We're just, let's just both be right. Maybe you, you know, love the Warriors and I love the Spurs. And so we can both celebrate the fact that we have a team that we can root for and invest in. Now, Jesus roots for the Spurs, so you got to kind of deal with that. <laughs> but once you go below this superficial level, this new definition of tolerance breaks down because there are logical and practical problems with saying that two opposite beliefs can both be correct. When you look at it in, in the realm of religion, how can you say that someone who practices Judaism and someone who considers himself a Christian are supposed to celebrate each other's beliefs as both being correct. When Judaism denies the divinity of Jesus Christ and the divinity of Jesus Christ is the central tenet in Christianity. There is a logical impossibility with both of those beliefs being right. There are many world religions who believe in their version of God. Some people believe that there is only one God. They're monotheistic. Some people believe there are multiple gods. And then atheists believe that there is no God at all. There's no supreme being. There's no creator. Everything's just happening by randomness or by chaos. So how could it be that an atheist and someone who believes in God are both correct and can both celebrate each other's beliefs. There are logical and practical impossibilities. Even outside the realm of religion, just when it comes to beliefs of morality that inform everything from our, our ethics to our worldview to our political leanings, there are certain beliefs that are opposite of each other and they cannot coexist and you cannot expect them to celebrate each other's differences. Someone who is pro-life will never be able to celebrate someone who is pro-choice because someone who's pro-life believes that humanity starts at conception and they will never be able to celebrate an opposite belief that leads to millions of, of children being aborted. It just can't happen. It is logically and practically impossible. And what happens in this new definition of tolerance and this new postmodern thought where we don't believe in any kind of real absolute truth is it encourages and requires us to soften our convictions. If you say this is my belief and I believe it is right, which means these other beliefs have to be logically wrong, you are labeled as intolerant. And the reality is, if you tolerate everything, then you can have conviction about nothing. So for 23 years, there has been a push for tolerance. And the question we have to ask is, how has that worked out for us? How does it work to just turn a blind eye and believe that there's not really any truth and your truth is yours and my truth is mine and let's pretend that they're both right? We're now in 2018 and when we look at the social and political landscape, people are more divided. There is more hatred, prejudice, racism are back on the rise. People are more entrenched in their own ideologies 
than at almost any other time in history. And not only that, but now we're also connected to everyone digitally. And what started as this beautiful idea to connect people and help you catch up with old friends. And then your grandma got on Facebook and it was so adorable because she didn't know what she was doing on there and nothing made sense. Now has just become this pool of hatred and divisiveness and we are more separated and more intolerant as a culture perhaps than we have ever been. Now this has a, a lot to do with society but also has a lot to do with the movement of Jesus. Uh, a couple years ago there was a poll that went out to over 900,000 people uh, of every demographic that you can imagine and in this poll the people who did not identify as believers in Jesus were asked what their primary problems were, what their issues were with the church. Why wouldn't they consider becoming a Christian? And the number one answer was intolerance. That the church at large is intolerant. One of the famous atheist philosophers named Christopher Hitchens said this. He said, religion has caused innumerable people not just to conduct themselves no better than others, but to award themselves permission to behave in ways that would make a brothel keeper or an ethnic cleanser raise an eyebrow. He concludes his thoughts by saying religion poisons everything. And this is one of the dominant views in society. And we've talked about this before. It's one of the reasons that the church has lost almost all of its influence in culture, that millennials are leaving the church at record rates. Every year, thousands of congregations are closing their doors as we become less and less relevant in our society. People not only see religion as something that is slightly intolerant, many people believe that religion has weaponized their beliefs to disenfranchise and marginalize anyone who believes differently than they do. And so how do we operate in this society that is so divided, so angry, so chaotic, that wants tolerance, but yet we believe in absolute truth as founded in the word of God. How do we engage and love people and show people the truth while still holding firmly to the convictions of our beliefs? Well, we're gonna be in 1 Peter chapter two today, like we've already read, we're gonna begin breaking this down. Peter was writing to a group of believers who were facing severe persecution. And you may know this, that the first church, that the early movement of Jesus faced extreme persecution. And a lot of it was rooted in fear because these people who all of a sudden believed in Jesus and gathered these communities together to do life together, they kept talking about a new kingdom, that they were residents of a different kingdom whose law was superior even to the laws of the land and whose king was the king of all of the kings, the ruler of it all. And this was seen as a threat. Christians were viewed as anarchists, as if they were coming in to try and assert their own rule and reign in the world. And so Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, to show these believers how they can engage with a culture that is divided and that sees them as an intolerant threat. And here's the first thing he says in this section in verse 13. He says, submit to every human authority because of the Lord. Everything we read past this verse is seen through the filter of submission. The entire passage is about submitting to other people. And submission is not something that is a very popular concept today. We don't like submission. We like freedom. We like independence. This week we celebrated Independence Day. And we're very proud and we should be of our American heritage. We're, we're this tiny colonies of, of people, no military, just loosely connected, came together and defeated the premier military in all of the world and earned our independence. It's an incredible thing that we celebrate on July the 4th. However, we can prioritize freedom to such a degree that things like humility and submission seem like backwards progress to us. And what Peter says is the key 
to not only living but thriving in a divided culture is to submit to every human authority. Now, the word authority there was translated from the original Greek of this passage because of its context. If you see on the screen, the next thing that it says uh, is whether it's to the emperor. And so because it's emperor and this Greek word can mean authority, we translated it as authority. But the most basic translation of this word is the word creature. Submit to every human creature. And there is an interesting parallel that Peter is doing here. Because at this time in this place in the world, the emperors, the kings, the rulers of society were actually seen as divine. We know by looking back through the history of Rome that the Roman emperors believed themselves to be and led people to believe that they were actually gods. And so the starting place for Peter is submission, but he says to submit to human creatures, human created beings like the emperor. He goes on to say like the governors, even like your fellow person. Submission is very simply translated to stand under someone else. Now, to stand under someone else, you first must lower yourself. And if you were here last week, we saw that the root definition of humility is to choose to lower yourself. You cannot submit without humility. But Humility requires that you understand your dignity, your status, and your position in the eyes of God. And the first thing Peter does by carefully choosing his words and saying submit to human creatures is he is letting us keep our eternal Christian perspective that we are all the same in the eyes of God, that God loves us the same, that he came down to this earth and died for us the same, whether you are the emperor or whether you are a peasant, you all have this dignity in God's eyes. And when you understand that power and that position, then you can choose humility to lower yourself and submission to stand under somebody else. Submit to every human creature because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, he continues down the hierarchy in 14, or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. In 15, he says, for it is God's will It is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. How many of you know some foolish people? Anybody? If they're they're next to you, don't look at them. Just keep your eyes. We all know some foolish people, and, and we like this command to silence the ignorance of foolish people. And a lot of us take that on as a a part-time job to silence the ignorance (laughs) of foolish people. But here's what Peter doesn't instruct his, his, his followers and these believers to do. He doesn't instruct them to silence the ignorance of the foolish by engaging with them in a debate. He doesn't say that it's up to us to log on and type until our fingers are bruised with our angry rhetoric defending our entrenched position as if anyone has ever changed their mind because of a Facebook argument. (laughs) He says that the way we silence the ignorant foolishness is by doing what? Is by doing good. Let's remember the context that this is being written in. The movement of Jesus was misunderstood. They thought that it was a movement of political anarchy. They didn't realize that it was a movement of radical love. And the way that you change somebody's mind about the movement of Jesus is not by throwing your hat in the rink and arguing and fighting and using divisive rhetoric. It is by doing what is good. Treating people how basic Treating people the way that you would want to be treated. Loving people without any kind of condition. And somewhere along the way, Christianity bought into this lie that it is our job to protect the glory 
of God. And so when we see something that doesn't fit into our moral beliefs, or our kids are being exposed to this, that, and the other, or you support this political agenda that goes against how I read scripture, then we take it upon ourselves to log on and speak up. We can't go to a family reunion without starting three fights. We can't engage with our coworkers without creating division because we see it as our job in this world to protect God's glory. And let me tell you something really simple. God has been doing just fine without you. The God that spoke the universe into creation can protect his own glory just fine. He doesn't need you to speak up and shout people down and lord your knowledge over them and patronize them. He needs you to humble yourself and to stand underneath someone who is lost in the lies of the world so that you can lift them up above the filth where they might just be able to see the truth of God. Every, uh, every presidential election, I'm not, I'm not a very political person. Uh, I, you know, I don't believe that uh, the stage of the ecclesia is a political platform. I have a problem with that. Um, but, but I like watching the, the show and every you know, election comes around. And, and, I, and I'm telling you, it'll happen in 2020. We'll have a new batch of crazy candidates who all want to be president for some reason. And, and, and this is what will happen. Everyone will get frustrated and, and everything else. And church signs, just wait. Some of you aren't from a church background. This is so foreign to you, and, and I love that you're, that you're here and that you find yourself at home here. Uh, those church signs will start popping up. 2020, vote for Jesus. Vo- vote for Jesus? Vote for Jesus? Je- Jesus needs your vote? Jesus does not need your vote? Because kings do not get elected to power, they rightfully assume their throne. Our job is to not police the morality of this world. Our job is not to go at every person who disagrees with our beliefs. Our job is to submit. Our job is to love to lift others up by taking some of our power and position, choosing to lower ourselves in service of those around us. In 16, he tells us three ways to submit. He says, submit as free people. We like that, free people. July 4th, we love it. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. That seems fair. But as God's slaves. And so, Peter, which one is it? Do you want us to submit as free people or do you want us to submit as slaves? Because it seems like there's a little bit of a paradox there. Submit out of your freedom and submit out of your slavery. And so how does, how does this work? Well, in one sentence, Peter has taught a biblical concept that you find all throughout the pages of Scripture. He starts with... Submit as free people. Now, our freedom spiritually is not something that we earn. It's not like how we became free in America by fighting and bloodshed and brave men and women. Our freedom was bought on a cross by Jesus Christ. That is how we become free. And at the moment that you realize your need for a savior, you recognize your sin and that it separates you from God both now and in eternity, you see Jesus and you trust in him as your savior, that moment of belief, you are now free from sin. You can be assured for the rest of your life that you will enter heaven someday. It doesn't matter where you go or what you do. You can even quit believing and live like hell for the rest of your life. And you will still end up in heaven because God's love is that good and Jesus' work was that powerful. And you can choose to do that. It's why Peter says, not using your freedom as a cover-up to do evil. Because you can live that life and decide you don't believe and live for the world and buy into all the lies. And you'll still... At the end of this life, wake up in heaven, and I'm guessing your first words will be, oh, crap, I was wrong. Because God's love has still saved you. You see, it's incredible. The greatest gift that God gives us is the gift of free will. 
And so we can believe in Jesus and we can be freed from the power of sin and yet still choose to live in slavery to it. The reality is we don't get to choose whether or not we are slaves in this world. We only get to choose our master. We live in our freedom, but if we want to exercise the full power of our freedom, we only find it in submitting to God as our master. This is what the Apostle Paul said all the time. He said, I am a slave to God. There are two options. You can be a slave to this world, to all of the sin, and to a society that is wanting to take you in, use you up, and then throw you out. Or you can submit yourself in servitude to the God who created you, who placed the purpose and passions inside of you, who has a plan for you before the creation of this world, and live in the power of your calling. You have two options. You can choose your master. We live in our freedom, but our freedom is applied when we come under the mighty hand of God as his slaves. He ends this section by saying, honor everyone. Honor everyone. And that's hard. There's a lot of people we don't have a problem honoring. Remember, this is all through the lens of Submission. There's a lot of people we wouldn't mind standing under. We love our kids. We'll honor our kids. We'll stand under them. We'll prop them up. Ephesians says, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, mutually submit. Love your wives. Prop them up. Lift them high. There are our bosses that we love. There are mentors. There are friends. But this says everyone. Honor the people who are the most dishonorable. And that's where it gets real. Honor everyone, love the brothers and the sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. And we don't have an emperor, but we do have a lot of political leaders. We do have a president, and maybe you love him, but maybe you hate him. And maybe you cannot stand the thought of submitting underneath him. And I get it, and that's a challenge. It's a challenge to submit and to honor people who we have no respect for. But what Peter is asking us to do in this process is to keep our perspective, our eternal perspective, because honor is a game of comparison, and you believe that someone doesn't deserve honor because you have certain values that you try to live out in your own personal life. And the most dishonorable person that you could ever imagine trying to submit yourself under is nothing compared to the difference between you and a perfect God who would leave heaven, come down to this earth and submit himself under you. We don't submit because of us because of what we're capable of, because we are good enough, we submit because the movement of Jesus is about walking in the footsteps of our Savior. And our Savior lived every moment of his life in humility. And he taught us that everyone who exalts themselves will be humbled. But those who can humble themselves, make the choice to lower yourself in service of others, who can submit to the people around you and lift them up where they just might be exposed to the light of God, that those people in due time will be exalted. We submit because the God who had no need to came down, humbled himself, and submitted to us. He stood under the weight of ridicule of the men he created. He stood under the weight of poverty, and ultimately he stood under the weight of our sin. It's not easy, but we learned last week that it was for this reason that Jesus is now seated, enthroned, above it all. It is for this reason that he has the name that is above every name, that at his name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, not because of his power, not because of his prestige, not because of his influence, but because of his humility. And every one of you also have an important life to live, a life of significance, but it will only come on the path of humility. 
This is not a movement of tolerance. The world says to exercise tolerance, to allow people to have their beliefs and to celebrate them as right. The gospel says to love. And we do not let people that we love believe things that will ultimately harm them. But we don't change people's minds through debate. We don't change it through Facebook. We don't change it through argument or rhetoric. We don't change it by further entrenching ourselves and separating ourselves. We don't change it by division. We don't change it by fear. We don't change it out of anger. We don't change people's minds, but we can change their hearts through love. It's not a movement of tolerance, it's a movement of radical love and respect for all people. Jesus said, if you want people to know that you're mine, they will know by how you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. The world needs a movement of people who are willing to stand on absolute truth, not as we deem it to be, not as we imagine it, but as we discover it out of Scripture. And the amazing thing about Christianity that separates it from all the other religions of the world is that the core conviction of Christianity is to love. And so you can have someone that you disagree with on every single level, and you are still called to love them, to humble yourself. And so if we stand strong to our conviction, then we will love. And if we love, we will see change. The ignorance and the foolishness that has taken over our society will not be changed by you making a better argument. This isn't a movement about softening our convictions. It is about softening our hearts. Let me pray for us. God, I recognize that this is difficult. We talk about love and we get excited about it and we talk about mercy and we get excited about it, but submission is hard. And so I pray that you would give us extra clarity, broaden our perspective, help us to keep in mind that we are in this world, but we are not of this world. That every decision we make is an investment in eternity. God, give us an extra helping of courage this week to submit, to stand under people that we couldn't imagine submitting to. God, not so that they can lord it over us, not so that we can think less of ourselves, but so we can lift others up so that they might see your truth. Jesus, we recognize that you came down to us broken, flawed, jacked up people in humility and in submission. Help us to walk that same path. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.